Everyone, uh, welcome back, uh, uh, most of you, and uh, great to see everyone again. I'm Kevin Kenny, Director of uh, Glaxman Ireland House. Uh, great um, pleasure, as well as an honour for me to introduce Dan Mulhall, uh, the former Irish ambassador to the United States, and in 2022, the inaugural visiting global distinguished professor of Irish studies here at uh, Glaxman Ireland House. And uh, Greta Mill Hall, uh, welcome back. <laughs> and uh, great memories uh, being relived uh, this, uh, this week. I'd also like to acknowledge um, Ted Smith, uh, president of our advisory board, and uh, so many uh, uh, friends and familiar faces, new faces too. Uh, we have uh, great things going on here every Thursday. Uh, take a look at the calendar, and I, I hope you'll come back if it's, if it's your first time. Uh, here with us in the house. Um, let me introduce Dan Mulhall, a native of Waterford. Um, Dan pursued his undergraduate and postgraduate studies at University College Cork, where he specialised in modern Irish history and lit literature uh, under the mentorship of Professor Joe Lee. Many of you know uh, Joe Lee, uh, my predecessor as uh, director of, of this house. Uh, Dan joined the Department of Foreign Affairs in 1978 and had his early diplomatic assignments in New Delhi, Vienna, uh, Brussels, and uh, Edinburgh. And uh, he served as Ireland's ambassador to Malaysia from 2001 to 2005, uh, where he was also accredited to Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. He was Ireland's ambassador to Germany uh, from 2009 to 2013 and to the United Kingdom directly afterwards through 2017. Um, towards the end of his term in the, in the UK, he was made a Freeman of the City of London in recognition of his work as ambassador. And in 2017, he received an honorary doctorate from the University of uh, Liverpool. Um, then to complete the trifecta, um, Dan arrived in Washington in 2017 as Ireland's 18th ambassador to the United States. He's the only Irish diplomat uh, to, hel to have held those key, two key uh, ambassadorships, uh, the UK and then uh, the US. Um, now, in addition to his work as a diplomat, uh, Dan has always been a scholar and a teacher at heart. As ambassador to the United States, he pioneered a form of public cultural diplomacy using uh, social media. Do, do, do you ever hear of Twitter? It's called uh, X now, and it's, uh, it's surviving. Uh, um, uh, and through lively blog posts, uh, dissemina disseminating um, insights into the work of the embassy and really engaged in diplomacy through, through um, the propagation of culture um, and uh, history. Uh, Dan is an accomplished public intellectual, the author of A New Day Dawning, Portrait of Ireland in 1900, uh, co-editor with Professor Eugenio Baggini, who was here uh, with us last month, um, of The Shaping of Modern Ireland. And then, as he enters a uh, prolific uh, writing phase, uh, freed of other duties, uh, Dan published Ulysses, uh, Reader's Odyssey in 2022, uh, which takes the reader on a journey through Ireland's, and indeed the world's, uh, most famous novel, uh, Joyce's uh, Ulysses. His latest book, uh, published uh, just late last year, is Pilgrim Soul, uh, W.B. Yeats and the Ireland of his time. Uh, just a couple of um, housekeeping items. Um, please silence your cell phones. Uh, just remember to do mine. Um, and this session is being uh, recorded. And Dan uh, will undoubtedly take questions immediately after his lecture. I know that. Uh, during the Q&A, uh, we're going to pass mics through both rooms. Uh, please use them because uh, we are recording the event and it picks up better on the audio and also people will be able to hear you um, around the space. Uh, the program will run until about 8.15. 
and then it will continue in a convivial setting uh, downstairs. So please join us after the uh, lecture as well. Uh, uh, do come in. Uh, you, can, you can sit right here in the front. And uh, without further ado, uh, Dan Mulhall. Uh, Thank you, uh, thank you, Kevin, and thank you, everyone. It's uh, great to be back. Um, it's, uh, I really enjoyed my uh, few months here. It was my first and only time teaching a, uh, an academic course at the university, so uh, I have fond, very fond memories of my time here, and uh, it's great to be able to talk about this book here in this place because I, a lot of the writing of this was done uh, during my uh, four months here at uh, NYU at Glucksman Ireland House, and I want to uh, thank Kevin and Ted in particular, and of course Loretta, who's maybe not here this evening, uh, the First Lady of Irish America, uh, for their support uh, during my time here, and indeed for inviting me to come back this week for the, for the gala and to, to uh, give this talk about uh, my book, Pilgrim Soul. Um, Brennan MacDonald, uh, who I met this afternoon, uh, who's uh, one of, um, one of uh, Kevin's students, asked me, when did you write this book? And I said, well, I started writing it in UCC in 1976, 77, when I was a master's student. But I, uh, you know, it was a slow gestation. It was a wine that needed a bit of time to, uh, to sort of, um, to mature so that it would be ready to be, uh, to be uh, exposed to the world. Uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, I started, you know, this idea that's, runs through this book of Yeats as a, as a public figure as well as a great poet. It's a sort of an idea that came to me really in the summer of 1975 um, at UCC because in those days um, in Cork, uh, the BA was a, a three-year BA and if you did an honours BA, you had to uh, spend the summer, the, the third summer, in Cork uh, or at, 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 at university and then you did your exams in, in the autumn so you had a summer of study and additional classes to, to sort of I suppose make up for, a, for, for the absence of a fourth year um, and I remember that summer of 75 it, it, it suddenly hit me that reading Yeats's poems that you were getting from those poems a kind of a narrative of Irish history and that idea was the basis of my uh, MA thesis, which I did under uh, Professor Joe Lee uh, in Cork. And I was his first master's student after he arrived at UCC in 1974. I, I started as a master's student with him the following year. So I was his first master's student. And I had the, the privilege, after I, I left here um, um, in, at the end of 2022, I had the privilege of, of going uh, to um, Magdalen College in Cambridge to be the Parnell Fellow there, and I was the 30th Parnell Fellow, and Joe Lee had been the first Parnell Fellow 30 years before. So I, I feel that uh, my life has been sort of wound, uh, bound up with um, uh, Joe Lee's very distinguished career, and that was another reason why I was really uh, delighted to, you know, to, uh, to come here. I remember coming here at Joe's uh, request, uh, uh, and it, uh, Joe invited me to give the, Ar the annual Irish language lecture here. And you know my Irish is pretty good, but it's not 100%. So I, I really had to work hard uh, to uh, to make sure that I was able to uh, deliver my, my lecture Osquelga uh, on that occasion. So that's just, that's where I where I got this idea, uh, and it's been with me for the last um, you know almost 45 years. And finally, when I when I retired and after I, I um, finished my book on, on James Joyce and that was published and then I started thinking, well, what will I do next? And I could see that retirement was looming. I, I came here and I, and I really started to, uh, I mean, I had some, some of the book written before I came here, but, but a lot of it was, was written here and then um, um, the, the rest of it was written at Magdalen College in Cambridge. And the final bit of proofreading with, with my uh, dear wife, Greta, was done at Harvard when I was there uh, in the uh, fall of, of, of last year as a, as, a, um, as, a, as a resident fellow at the Institute of Politics at the Harvard Kennedy School. So, uh, the point I want to make tonight is that while W.B. Yeats described himself in Among Schoolchildren, one of his greatest poems, as 
a 60-year-old smiling public man. My argument is that Yeats was a public man throughout his life and that he, he wanted to be a public man. We have, sometimes have the image of Yeats maybe drawn from, you know, the late Galavinish Free and when you were old, those great lyric poems of the late 19th century, that he was this kind of rather, rather airy, aesthetic character. In fact, he was someone who was deeply uh, embedded and involved in the, the public life of Ireland really throughout his career from the 1880s on to the 1930s. So, um, and for example, in one of his early poems, he wrote that, uh, he, he wrote that he, that he was a writer who wanted to sing to sweeten Ireland's wrong. So he had this kind of sense of himself as a writer who wanted to write on behalf of Ireland, to sweeten Ireland's wrong. But he also made the point, very important, that he wanted not just to write about Ireland's wrong, he also wanted to write about things discovered in the deep. So in other words, he wasn't just going to be a, a hack writer, uh, someone maybe like the Young Ireland writers who, whose, whose principal purpose in writing was to write political verse. That wasn't really Yeats's uh, um, approach because he, he, he wanted to, to ensure that his writing, while it would serve an Irish cause, it would also reach and maintain a high literary standard. So, uh, and, and, he, and, he, and he wrote about, he wanted to compose a druid tune for a druid land. So he had this idea of ancient Ireland as this, as this extraordinarily exotic and meaningful place whose culture and history and story had a relevance to the modern world, and not just to Ireland, because Yeats's early view was that Ireland should be a bastion of idealism and of, of, of mystical thinking that would combat the materialism of the late Victorian and early 20th century world into which his poetry emerged. So, um, so, uh, so, the reason I think why Yeats's public life gets short shrift in many ways is because most of the work, the scholarship on Yeats, is by literary scholars who are naturally inclined to focus on the text, whereas I'm more inclined to engage in contextual analysis rather than textual. And I think that actually the, the context of Yeats's work actually casts some very important light on the work, but I think it also casts some light on the Ireland of, of Yeats's time. So I'm, my approach is to, to view Ireland through the elevated window provided by the life and work of William Butler Yeats. I took the same approach when I was writing about Joyce in my last book, Ulysses the Reader's Odyssey, because there I try to examine turn of the century Ireland through the pages of Joyce's Ulysses, but also to explore Ulysses through 20th century Ireland, believing again that the context of the book could help an understanding of the complexities of, of Joyce's novel. Joyce had a laser-like focus on the Ireland he knew before he departed from Ireland in, in 1904. And I have argued that, in a way, Joyce's novel is a kind of an elegy for the fading world of Charles Stuart Parnell and those who followed Parnell and who were devastated by the calamitous fall from grace of Parnell in 1890 and his death shortly afterwards in 1891, which divided Ireland deeply. And those divisions, of course, are graphically portrayed in Joyce's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, where the Christmas dinner scene is one of the best, uh, I think, insights you can have into the, the depth of the divisiveness that was generated by the fall of Charles George Parnell. So Yeats's story was a very different one. 
he was a product of, a classic product of middle class Protestant Ireland. On one side you had, on his mother's side, you had a merchant family, the Polexvins of Sligo. On the father's side, the family were mainly Church of Ireland clergymen, and his father an artist. So he was not a natural candidate to be the unofficial poet laureate of Irish nationalism. Indeed, the more predictable course for Yeats would have been to uh, follow in the footsteps of Oscar Wilde and to conquer the upper echelons of the English literary world, deploying perhaps a dash of Irish flair in order to uh, make that ascent to the top of the literary tree, as um, Wilde did. But as he explained in his autobiographies, at the age of 20, Yeats, under the tutelage of the old Fenian, John O'Leary, decided he wanted to be an Irish writer. And he never really strayed from that decision, despite all of the, the difficulties he encountered, the disenchantments, the disillusionments, he continued for the rest of his life to, to be an Irish writer. And in his, one of his last poems, Under Ben Bulban, he talked about the importance of what he called the indomitable Irishry. In other words, regardless of anything else, cast your mind on early days to so the we in the coming days still may be the indomitable Irishry. So he urged uh, uh, his readers and his fellow um, citizens of Ireland to, 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 to continue to, to express their Irish identity uh, in the way that Yeats had tried to do through his uh, poetry. Now, the fall of Parnell uh, in 1890 and then his death in 1891 became a a seminal moment in the writing life of James Joyce. It was part of the reason why Joyce left Ireland in, in 1904. Yeats had a, a different response. For, for Joyce, Parnell's fall was a disaster, and it was uh, his father, of course, never recovered from his hero falling from grace in the way that Parnell did. His father was a devoted follower and supporter of Charles Stuart Parnell. In my Ulysses book, I had this kind of little um, notion that had Parnell gone on, had he survived, and had he gone on to, to deliver home rule for Ireland, you could have imagined John Stanislaus Joyce, uh, Joyce's father, becoming a, a significant figure in a home rule Ireland. And then his son, James, might have, might have inherited the mantle and could have ended up uh, as a political figure in early 20th century Ireland rather than a literary figure in exile in, in Trieste, but that's a, the, the, that was just a little, a little fantasy that I, that, that, you know, like, that I thought about when I was writing the book. So, so for Yeats, um, he didn't see Parnell's fall as the unmitigated disaster that it was viewed as by James Joyce. No, for Yeats, it was an opportunity to carve out a new path for Ireland's future. He wanted, he had the idea, you move away from the grimy world of parliamentary politics into the brighter avenue of literary and cultural nationalism. So he saw, and he said, for example, uh, he said that this is an opportunity, the fall of Parnell, the death of Parnell, was an opportunity to, um, in the teeth of the bitter split between Parnellites and anti-Parnellites, Yeats said that cultural nationalism could, and I quote, hold out the flag of truce to all nationalists, thus helping to make the fanatic less fanatical and the rancorous less bitter. So he saw Parnell's fall as a chance for a new beginning for Ireland with a cultural rather than a political focus. In the first volume of his autobiographies, published in, in 1914, uh, Yeats recalled that when Parnell died, that he, Yeats, had been seized by, and I quote, the sudden certainty that Ireland was to be like soft wax for years to come. And Yeats felt that he could help to mould this wax into something that would be productive for Ireland and indeed uh, for Yeats. By the time Yeats arrived in Stockholm 
in 1923, he had developed a full-blown historical thesis uh, based on, on his uh, assessment of the impact of the fall of Parnell. He saw a thread running from the death of Parnell to the cultural nationalism of the 1890s and to the Easter Rising and on to the War of Independence. And here's how Yeats put it in Stockholm, which I, I think this is an example of Yeats as a, as a great historian as well as a great literary figure. The modern literature of Ireland and indeed all that stir of thought which prepared for the Anglo-Irish War began when Parnell fell from power in 1891. A disillusioned and embittered Ireland turned away from parliamentary politics. An event was conceived and the race began, as I think, to be troubled by that event's long gestation. So here you have Yeats maintaining that the demise of Parnell had caused Irish people to immerse themselves in cultural movements, the Gaelic League and the Irish literary movements, both products of the 1890s, and what I would call, what I, I like to call, Ireland's cultural fin de siècle. We didn't have that kind of um, gilded age that, that uh, other parts of the world experienced through economic uh, expansion of the kind that you had in, in, in the United States and, uh, and in Europe as well. But uh, with Ireland, we did have a, a, a cultural flourishing in the 1890s, which I would like to think of as Ireland's cultural fin de siècle. So Yeats thought that all of those movements were part of a stir of thought that prepared the way for Irish independence in 1922. Now, of course, you can debate that statement and its validity till the cows come home, as they say. But you'd have to say it's a pretty brilliant piece of writing, and it has attracted a lot of attention over the years, including from myself. Now, of course, Roy Foster, um, Yeats's biographer, argues that, well, you know, the 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 Fenian element was maybe more important in the uh, creation of the conditions that led to the Easter Rising, and I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't dispute that. But I do think that the cultural movements that flourished at the turn of the century had an influence on the intellectual climate from which the revolutionary generation emerged. In particular, the Gaelic League was a kind of a political nursery for those who went on to play their part in the Easter Rising and the two Two leaders of the Rising, Patrick Pierce and Thomas McDonough, both found their feet initially uh, through the Gaelic League, and they were drawn into public life uh, through the Gaelic League, and then ultimately uh, fighting and dying uh, in, in the Easter Rising. And of course, you think about it, the character that Yeats probably obsessed about most throughout his life was Cuchulain mythical character. In the 1890s, Yeats was writing in the early 90s about Cuchulain who fought the invulnerable tide. And then in his, in his last piece of writing, the death of Cuchulain, when Yeats himself was close to death, he wrote about uh, Cuchulain whose eyes stared out of the branches and were gone. So, and of course this figure of Cuchulain was an inspiration not just to Yeats, but also to those who fought in the Easter Rising in 1916. And if you go to the GPO in Dublin today and look in the, the window of the GPO, you will see a statue of Cuchulain done by Oliver Shepherd, uh, who was a, a, a classmate of Yeats's at the um, art, at art school in Dublin in the 1880s. So Yeats once told John O'Leary that, and I quote, the mystical life is the center of all I do and all that I think and all that I write. And he described his writing as part of the, quote, revolt of the soul against the intellect. And Yeats's enthusiasm for Ireland had a kind of a mystical flourish. He saw Ireland as a kind of a mystical uh, pursuit, which, you know, matched well to Yeats's own literary uh, enthusiasms and, and literary approach. Now, in an essay um, written when he was just 21 years of age, Yeats raved about the glories of ancient Ireland. 
that he had just discovered, by the way. Wouldn't you like to be able to write with this kind of confidence? I don't think you'd get away with it now. Um, they'd probably troll you on Twitter or X if you did, if you wrote like this. But he said, this is a, a review of a book, uh, the, the Collected Works of Samuel Ferguson, who was a sort of predecessor to Yeats, who was a, a unionist figure, but, but he wrote about uh, Cúchulain and, 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 the Fenia, and, and, and the Fenians and so on. But Yeats wrote, in the garden of the world's imagination, there are seven great cycles. The seven great cycles of legends. The Indian, the Homeric, the Charlemagnic, the, the Spanish circling round the Cid, the Arthurian, the Scandinavian, and the Irish. All differing from the other as the peoples who created them. So, you know, uh, here was Yeats. And this remember this is a time when, you know, Irish culture would have been derided. You know, if you read the Punch magazine or a lot of the British sort of mainstream publication would have regarded this kind of Celtic stuff as sort of, you know, barbaric nonsense. And Yeats was kind of, was arguing as a 21-year-old that the Irish mythological cycles were up there with the Scandinavian, the Indian, the Homeric. No, no lack of, uh, no lack of comfort there. Yeah, but that was important, you know, important to, to make that point. I think, and I, and I think you have to hand it to Yeats for, for, for having, for having the courage to argue that case. It wouldn't have been popular with a lot of people. You know? So for the young Yeats, there was something special about ancient Ireland, whose legends were on a par with the great jewels of world literature. Yeats argued the case for an Irish national literature in the English language. He did so tenaciously and unremittingly through multiple essays in newspapers and journals. And he took the view, he, he took aim at Trinity College, because in Trinity College there were academics like uh, Atkinson and, uh, and, um, and Mahaffey, who basically scoffed at this idea of Irish. He said everything that, that was in Gaelic was, uh, was either barbaric or obscene. And he took them on. And he talked about uh, Trinity College. He said Trinity College was servile to English notions. And in his youthful rhetoric, he dismissed what he called the shoddy society of West Britainism. This is reminiscent. This is a point I, I, I uh, want to make, is that while in the early part of the 20th century, Yeats was the target of people uh, who were calling themselves Irish Irelanders, people like D.P. Moran, who was a, a, a crusading journalist, the editor of the Leader newspaper, and Moran basically argued that to be Irish you had to be Irish-speaking and Catholic, and Yeats was neither. So he wanted to exclude Yeats, if you like, from the Irish nation. But in the 1890s, Yeats had some of the same attitudes that Moran exhibited 10 years later. And Anglophobia was actually part of, of Yeats's rhetorical arsenal from the outset. He suggested at one stage he wanted to exclude from an Irish anthology, quote, every poem that shows English influence in any marked way. So in other words, not only could it not be a poem written by an English person, but it couldn't have, have any English influence in it, which would probably exclude a lot of people. I mean, uh, Thomas McDonough actually wrote his, um, his MA thesis on Elizabethan English, and Elizabethan English writer. So, you know, but Yeats was, was so he was, quite a, he was quite a vigorous exponent of a kind of a, a cultural nationalism that didn't take any prisoners when it came to uh, deriding those that he didn't uh, care for. So, um, uh, now there are those, of course, who assume that uh, Yeats's political engagement in the 1890s was a product of his obsession with Maud Gone and her radical brand of nationalism. I think that's overstating the case. She was, of course, part of the story, but not the whole shebang, um, if I may use an academic word like that. Um, <laughs> Yeats was drawn into the Fenian orbit uh, to his association with Maud, and he may have taken the, the um, IRB oath. He may have taken the Fenian oath. Uh, Roy Foster, in his, in, in his biography of Yeats, says he, 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 it seems pretty, pretty um, likely that Yeats actually took the Fenian oath. Um, of course, part of it was Yeats was a great lover of secret lore and so on. It was probably, you know, the idea of taking the Fenian oath probably appealed to him no end. But he had this, Morgan brought him, brought him on, brought him to meet um, the Boer representatives in London with a madcap idea of getting money from the, from the Boer republics 
to uh, plant bombs on, on British troop ships that were ferrying troops uh, to uh, South Africa for the Boer War, which would have killed probably a lot of Irish soldiers who were, who were on their way to South Africa at that time. And, and of course, um, a lot of people don't realize that uh, if you enter St. Stephen's Green uh, from Grafton Street, you walk under uh, an archway which is devoted to uh, remembering the, uh, the um, service of the Dublin Fusiliers uh, in the uh, South African War on the British side. Of course, there were others, uh, a smaller number of Irish people like um, John McBride, who became Maud Gon's husband, who fought for the Boer. But for the most part, uh, Irish soldiers were um, part of the, the, uh, the British uh, side of that uh, conflict. So, um, um, Yeats was, um, he demonstrated really all of the markers of advanced nationalism of the late 19th century. For example, he was involved with Gone, with Maud Gone, in countering the celebrations of Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in 1897, an activity that also involved James Connolly. So again, an example of how Yeats was connected with people who went on to become uh, leaders of the Easter Rising. And I mean, on that occasion, one of those occasions when Yeats and Gone were at the demonstration, the demonstration turned violent and people were killed and Yeats actually had to spirit gone away and locked her into a, a, a club where, there were, where he was a member and, and, so that she, and wouldn't let her go out again because he was afraid that, that she might come to, uh, uh, to a violent end given uh, the kind of violence that was, that, that was um, uh, running through the streets of Dublin at that time. Yeats was also the chairman of the 19, 1798 Centennial Association celebrating the centenary of the United Irishmen's rising. And Roy Foster refers to the explicitly Fenian mode of many of Yeats's uh, speeches at that time. You know, he traveled around the country giving speeches about the centenary of the uh, 1798 rising, you know, extolling what he called the high and holy cause of Irish freedom. Now, this, of course, didn't stop Yeats from being a very popular figure uh, in the salons of literary London and the country houses of, the, of his well-to-do acquaintances uh, from the upper echelons of British society. I, I came across a, there's a funny thing, um, there, there was a man called um, Howard de Walden who was a, was a well-known horse trainer and, and owner uh, and he was an aristocrat, he, he was, um, his, his mansion was at Audley End which is uh, in near Cambridge. We actually visited it there uh, last year during our time at Magdalen College and um, um, Howard Walden is mentioned in Ulysses because he had a horse running in the Ascot Gold Cup uh, in 1904 and he's mentioned by Ulysses and uh, Yeats uh, knew him and used to go out to his mansion for weekends and, uh, but Howard Walden wrote at one stage, he said, well, you should never miss a chance to hear um, William Butler Yeats speak but you should never pay any attention to what he says. <laughs> so, in other words, he had, a, he had a rather mixed view of, of, of Yeats's uh, uh, um, um, you know, a wisdom, the wisdom that Yeats might be able to impart. Um, so, um, Yeats, like Maud Gone, was a supporter of the Boer cause in the Boer War. Remember, this was a time when there was this jingoistic uh, attitude in uh, Britain at the time, uh, supporting the British cause against the Boers, and yet in Ireland, and including with W.B. Yeats and Maud Gone and those, and Arthur Griffith, there was a, there, there a pro-Boer uh, sentiment. And because of that, Yeats opposed the visit to Ireland in 1900 of Queen Victoria. And he wrote uh, publicly in the Freeman's Journal that it was the duty of Irishmen to protest against the visit, quote, with as much courtesy as is compatible with vigor. In the conservative Daily Express, Dublin Daily Express, he warned that those who cheered the Queen would also be cheering an empire that was robbing the Boer republics of their liberty just as it had robbed Ireland of its freedom. So connecting the Boer cause with the cause of Irish freedom. Uh, Percy French uh, had a go at Yeats. Um, uh, he brought a, he wrote a bit a bit of a lampoon of Yeats, saying, uh, and he he put these words into uh, the mouth of Queen Victoria, and had her take aim at Yeats. He said something like, "He should be he should stay at home," says uh, says she. Uh, French polish in her poems, says she, instead of parading me crimes, says she, in the Irish Times, says she. So, 
this is probably an indication of how unionist Ireland might have viewed. I mean, Percy French was a, was a kind of a moderate unionist, but he it probably indicates how how uh, how the um, uh, unionist Ireland maybe uh, viewed Yeats's um, opposition to the visit of Queen Victoria. And of course, Yeats was delighted about this because he felt that his um, his position on in opposing the visit of Queen Victoria was making it very popular with the younger generation, and he really exulted in that. Um, and then, of course, he also opposed the visit in 1903 of King Edward uh, VII, someone of whom Yeats had a low opinion, uh, as evidenced by the reference in his poem in the Seven Woods to, quote, new commonness upon the throne. And um, there's another uh, example of, of a Yeats-Joyce connection, because um, in Ulysses, um, um, in the um, Cyclops episode, Joyce has, uh, has this kind of um, humorous, um, or, uh, sorry, the citizen, which is was based on Michael Cusack, the founder of the GEA, had this um, say, what about you know, the holy boys in Maynooth who put up images of, of, the, of his majesty's racing colors uh, to welcome uh, the king to Maynooth? And, um, and actually Yeats was the one who wrote about that in the United Irishmen in 1903, criticizing the bishops for, for honoring the king by putting up uh, his racing colors. In Ulysses, Joyce goes, goes further and says, uh, one, of the, one of the characters in the pub says, why didn't they put up his women, images of his women? And the answer was, considerations of space influenced their lordship's decision. <laughs> Which I think, is one of the, I think is the funniest line in the whole of Ulysses. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, I, I should I, I, I should move on, I think. <laughs> uh, but um, so um, so Yeats's embrace of advanced nationalism probably peaked in 1902 with the Dublin production of Kathleen the Houlihan. It was written in tandem with Lady Gregory, and it's the most openly nationalistic work that Yeats ever wrote. Set in 1798, the play depicts a visit to the Galan family by an old woman, Kathleen the Houlihan who, in an unmistakable allegory of Ireland's historical experience of dispossession, complains that strangers had come and taken her land. She promises to make those who join her in expelling the strangers to make them famous forever. Quote, they shall be remembered forever. They shall be alive forever. They shall be speaking forever. The people shall hear them forever. As the play draws to a close, the old woman is transformed into a young girl who had, quote, the walk of a queen. Uh, of course, Kathleen was played by Maud Gaughan. Uh, and Yeats gushed that Maud had played Kathleen, quote, magnificently and with weird power, whatever that means. Um, <laughs> if you ever hear anybody describe a Broadway performance as weird power, you'll know you're probably, probably Harry Potter or something like that. Anyway, so the writer and politician Stephen Gwynne, who attended the performance, wrote, I wondered if such plays should be produced unless one was prepared for people to go out to shoot and be shot. George Bernard Shaw considered it to be a play, quote, which might lead a man to do something foolish, end quote. While, while the Abbey's Lennox Robinson thought, quote, it had made more rebels in Ireland than a thousand political speeches or a hundred reasoned books. There we are now, reasoned books. That's what we write, isn't it? Yes, it is. Towards the end of his days, Yeats was still wondering, did, did that play of mine send out certain men the English shot? Yeats's long decade of disenchantment with Ireland can be traced back to the final year of the 19th century, when his play, The Countess Kathleen, gave rise to demonstrations in the theatre, which was the first in a series of, of problems that Yeats had with plays of the, what, what became the Abbey Theatre. And Yeats, of course, couldn't resist going into battle uh, to defend his play and to attack his detractors. One of his detractors was, was his eminence, Cardinal Logue, the uh, primate of Ireland. Um, and Yeats um, hit back at the cardinal, saying that he had displayed singular naivety. He believed that Logue did not represent, quote, the opinion of the younger and more intellectual Catholics. You can imagine how that went down in era Chile, uh, in, 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 in Armagh, should it have been shown, should this 
piece of, uh, of, of Yeats' um, uh, rhetoric have been shown to, to Cardinal Logue. But, so Yeats was, he was not afraid to, 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 to take people on in a rather vigorous way. His early years in, in the Abbey Theatre also frustrated him, and he wrote in one of his poems, my curse on plays that have to be set up in 50 ways on the day's war on every knave and dolt, theatre business, management of men. There we are. His disenchantment deepened as the decade wore on, as he became the target of those, of those who would not accept that Irish literature could be written in the English language. Patrick Pearce, writing in, as a Gaelic leaguer in the early part of the 20th century, dismissed Yeats's Irish literary theatre as, quote, anti-national, while Arthur Griffith, once an ally of Yeats's, became a sharp critic of Singh's work. For Griffith, Singh's play by the Western world was a tale of, quote, unnatural murder and unnatural lust told in foul language. Maud, of course, approved of the protesters who disrupted uh, the performance of the Playboy in the Abbey Theatre. She said they were earnest young fellows, she called them, and thought their action in disrupting the performance of the Playboy was a healthy thing. So she took the position that, that the Playboy was a kind of a, was a, kind of a, um, a disparaged, uh, the sort of peasantry of the West of Ireland, and therefore uh, Irish, young Irish nationalist youth were, were fully entitled to make their views known. Yeats was on a lecture tour, a tour of Scotland when the Playboy premiered, and he rushed back to confront Singh's detractors. He took to the Abbey stage, brandishing his advanced nationalist credentials as the author of Kathleen Lee Houlihan and the president of the 1998 Centennial Committee. Sorry, the 1798 Centennial Committee. But his appeals fell on deaf ears. With a characteristic Yeatsian flourish, he fumed that quote. The quarrel of our theatre today is the quarrel of theatre in many lands. For the old Puritanism, the old bourgeois dislike of power and reality have not changed, even when they are called by some Gaelic name. So as I say, it was a, he, was, he was not exactly a shrinking violet. He, he really did, I think, quite enjoy. And in fact, Padre Cullum, uh, who uh, spent a lot of his life in the city, um, I think was here, died here in the 1960s. Um, Padre Cullum wrote about Yeats in the early part of the... 20th century, saying that he was a marked man, marked by the unionist element in Ireland that didn't like his nationalism, and marked by the, the more Catholic nationalists for being this kind of esoteric uh, thinker. Uh, and, he, and, and, and Colin made the point that, that Yeats, when he was going around Dublin, looked every inch a public man. And Colin made the point that he said, and Yeats wanted more than anything else to be a public man. So he had this desire to be, uh, to be a player, not just in the, the world of literature, but also in the um, world of public affairs. Now, the rumpus surrounding Singh's Playboy became a turning point in Yeats's uh, engagement with Irish affairs. And together with the controversy surrounding the Lane pictures, it drew from Yeats a series of bitter poetic tirades that found their way into his collection responsibilities, in which he decried, quote, the blind and ignorant town and, quote, the obscure spite of our pawding in his shop. And this is, I think, very unpleasant, rather, rather revealed an unpleasant strand of bigotry on Yeats's part, because he wrote poems about deriding Biddy and pawding. And these, of course, are names that clearly meant to, 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 to refer to, to the sort of um, you know, ordinary Dubliners and people from, from sort of you know, working-class uh, Catholic backgrounds. Now, the terminus of, of Yeats's disillusionment with Ireland came in September 1913, which proclaimed the death of Romantic Ireland, interred with Yeats's first mentor, John O'Leary. In the poem, Yeats writes with unfettered self-confidence about the Ireland of his time. He leaves no room for doubt as to the depth of his conviction that something vitally important had ceased to be in early 20th century Ireland. Those he sees as the guilty parties are savagely derided they fumble in a greasy till. They add prayer to shivering prayer until they have dried the marrow from the bone. So very, very bitter. Uh, however, well, some of the other poems in that collection I don't like at all, like Paul and Biddy and these ones. I don't. I think they're they're, they're you know they're below they're beneath the standard that Yeats ought to have set for himself. This one is bitter as well, but it has that kind of uh, elegy quality to it when he sort of when he when he writes in the following. Was it for this the wild geese spread the great 
wing upon every tide, for this that all that blood was shed, for this that Ro Edward Fitzgerald died and Robert Emmett and Wolfe Tone, all that delirium of the brave. What a great line that is. All that delirium of the brave. Romantic Ireland's dead and gone, it's with O'Leary in the grave. At that time, it would not have been surprising to find a disheartened Yeats throwing in the towel, abandoning Ireland altogether, and maybe comforting himself with a, a British knighthood that was offered to him at one stage, but he refused it, and a possible Port Laureate ship. Had he done so, some of his finest poems would likely never have been written. Less than three years after Yeats proclaimed the death of Romantic Ireland, the events of 1916 represented a rebirth. The Easter Rising became a turning point in Yeats's life and in his writing. It led to his return to Ireland after three decades spent mainly in London. He decided in 1916 that he would return to Ireland to help to build a new Ireland. For the last 25 years of his life, Ireland became Yeats's home. Uh, his writing also deepened and developed. And for me at least, and I'm sure there'll be debates about this, but for me at least, Easter 1916 is the first great poem of Yeats's full maturity. Yeats was ambivalent about the rising, and he accurately feared the effects of a spiral of violence. As he was putting pen to paper in the summer of 1916, he recognized that everything had been changed utterly. Although that was by no means evident in the rising's immediate aftermath. In fact, when I was doing a, a piece about D.P. Moran uh, some years ago for, my, for the book I co-edited with Eugenio Biagini, uh, The Shaping of Modern Ireland, uh, I was looking at, at Moran's response to the rising. And Moran was, you know, a very vigorous nationalist, but his attitude in 1916 was no. These young have to move aside and let the old hands come back and do a deal with Britain. You know, Redmond and, and John Dillon and all these people, that they were the ones that needed to be brought back because they had the experience of dealing with the authorities in London. So it was, I think, quite perceptive of Yeats to spot the fact that in, in the summer of 1916 that all had changed, changed utterly, and that a terrible beauty had been born. And then you have this wonderful line of Yeats's wondering if too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. That really made him fall out with Maud Gone in a big way, because she said, no, 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 sacrifice is the ultimate. It doesn't make a stone of the heart. It makes people brilliant. It makes them heroic. So they had a, a real difference on that one. And then his ambivalence is brilliantly captured in the line, a terrible beauty is born. And Yeats also, in the summer of 1916, asked a question that has been argued about by Irish historians since, particularly in the last 50 years, the period of historical revisionism and counter-revisionism and so forth. Because in this poem, he writes, was it needless death after all, for England may keep faith for all that is done and said. That is essentially Yeats, within months of the Easter Rising, asking, was it necessary? And John Bruton, who died recently, is someone who argued very strongly that the rising shouldn't have taken place, that Ireland would have achieved independence without the violence that followed on in the wake of 1916. Now, Yeats had written Irish poems throughout his life, but after 1916, his writing became more fully concerned with aspects of what we now know of as 20th century Irish history. Poems like 1919, deals with the War of Independence. And, you know, he really did take aim at, the, at, at black and tan atrocities. And I quote, a drunken soldiery can leave the mother murdered at her door to crawl away in her own blood and go scot-free. So, uh, Conor Cruz O'Brien, who once lived, by the way, just next door here, in, uh, in, in the next building from this, um, he pointed out at one stage that it was quite brave thing for Yeats to publish a poem like that during the War of Independence and to take aim at the Black and Tans in that way could easily have led to, to retaliation against him. The Second Coming captured a world seemingly falling apart in Ireland and across Europe in the wake of World War I. He spent part of the Civil War exposed, directly exposed, he, he actually watched the Civil War happening in front of him in County Galway 
from uh, Tour Bally Lee, his, uh, his tower in the west of Ireland. And he came up with these wonderful lines. We had fed the heart on fantasies, the hearts grown brutal from the fair. More substance in our enmities than in our love. I think it was worth the risk of exposing Yeats and his family to the Civil War to get lines of that quality. These kind of wonderful lines. We had fed the heart on fantasies, the hearts grown brutal from the fair. More substance in our enmities than in our love. Wonderful lines in my, in my view. And lines that, that clearly would not have been written had it not been for Yeats's direct connection with the events of the Ireland of the early 20th century. And then, in memory of Eva Gore Booth and Con Markovitz, the light of evening, Lissadell, great windows open to the south, two girls in silk kimonos, both beautiful, one a gazelle. This is my favourite among the many poems that Yeats wrote out of his infatuation with Anglo-Ireland and its loftiest 18th century figures, Swift, Burke and Berkeley. This embrace of Anglo-Ireland, and by the way, Yeats had derided 18th century Georgian Ireland uh, during his youth, um, but now he, he lauded it, and I think this lauding of, of Anglo-Ireland, of the Anglo-Irish tradition, mirrored his disappointment with the realities of Irish independence. However, Yeats' obsession with Anglo-Ireland was a bit of a cul-de-sac, because um, those, with, those with whom Yeats socialised in the early years of independence were unlikely to be swayed by the poet's championing of the people of Burke, the people of Grattan, and the people of Parnell, as he raged against the narrowness of the Irish Free State. And Yeats is famous, that, those lines are taken from Yeats' infamous, I suppose, famous or infamous uh, Senate speech when he opposed uh, the ban on divorce. And Yeats actually, if you look at his, what he said now, today, uh, today's Ireland would, would applaud what Yeats said, but of course, saying those kind of things, uh, taking that kind of liberal approach in the 1920s was, was putting himself outside the, you know, the mainstream of, of, of Irish Free State politics. When Yeats was awarded the Nobel Prize, it represented a recognition of Ireland's emergence the year before. In announcing Yeats's prize, the Swedish Academy stressed that he had helped to create, quote, a new national literature and had captured, quote, the spirit of a nation. So the Academy recognised that they were, they were not just honouring a great writer, they were honouring a, a writer who had played a role in the emergence of a new state, the Irish Free State that emerged the year before. When Yeats described himself in 1925 as a 60-year-old smiling public man, that was an accurate description, for he was then at the midpoint of an act of two-term membership of the first Irish Senate. He is estimated to have attended 60% of all of the Senate sessions during his term of office. Pretty, pretty good, uh, given that he was a, a writer with lots of other responsibilities, you know, involved in the Abbey Theatre and so on. The fact that he, he attended more than half of the Senate sessions was something that I think is commendable on his part. His presence in the Senate proved important in supporting the fledgling state that was immediately beset by civil war. Yes, of course, his most important contribution in the Senate was his chairing of the, of the coinage commission that, that actually chose the designs for Irish coinage that were still in circulation until the euro uh, came into circulation at the end of the 20th century. And Yeats's uh, committee decided, instead of using patriotic symbols, that the coinage would contain images of, of livestock, because livestock at that time, of course, was the mainstay of the Irish economy. When the Senate paid tribute to Yeats's Nobel Prize success, its chairman, Lord Denavi, praised his, quote, courage and patriotism in throwing in his lot with his own people on the conditions that called for the exercise of great moral courage. So Glenavi recognised that Yeats had made a, made, made a moral stand by deciding to, to become part of the public life of the fledgling Irish Free State. Um, I think that, um, just to mention that the elephant in the room with Yeats uh, is always his brush with fascism. Now, um, in my book, I make the point that, um, that the Irish blue shirts, O'Duffy's 
fascists were more Irish than fascist. And that, that essentially the blue shirts, that movement was a kind of a, was a, was, was a, left, bit, of a left, bit of leftover stuff from the Civil War that had ended 10 years before. And I think Yeats was fortunate that Irish fascism was such an unprepossessing phenomenon. In that sense, his residence in the Irish Free State did him a service by, divert, by diverting his gaze from settling on what he wrote as Roman or on Russian or on Spanish politics. His interest in the emergence of an Irish strongman was badly misplaced because such a figure in Ireland would almost certainly have been in the mould of General Francisco Franco, uh, a deeply Catholic figure who would not have appealed to Yeats. This idea that an Irish strongman would somehow have, have created conditions that would have been more conducive to Yeats's vision of Ireland, I think, was a complete uh, misreading of the situation. But given Yeats's conservative leanings, he would have been at risk to himself had he been a Spanish, a French, or a German writer. Better to grapple with those whose portraits hung in Dublin's municipal gallery, Arthur Griffith and Caseman and so forth, than to, to, to write about the rogues gallery of European tyrants of that era. So my, my argument is that Yeats, his residence in Ireland saved him from perhaps becoming more deeply uh, invested in some of the, 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 the nasty political movements of the interwar period. So right up to the late 1930s, when Yeats was, was, an, uh, was a dying man, he persisted in writing about Irish nationalist figures. He wrote two poems in the mid-30s about Roger Casement. He even wrote a poem about the O'Reilly, who was a fairly obscure figure who fought and died in the Easter Rising. And Yeats wrote a poem about him. And he became convinced that the Irish had been, quote, born into that ancient sect, but had been thrown upon this filthy modern tide. So the Irish were, if you like, um, they were dispossessed from this ancient sect and then catapulted into this uh, rather, rather um, uh, unprepossessing modern world in Yeats's view. In one of his final poems, he returned to his youthful belief in the glories of the Irish past, insisting that ancient Ireland knew it all. Yeats's political journey, or his Taurus, as I call it in my book, and the word Taurus means in Irish both journey and pilgrimage, uh, it took him from romantic nationalism in the 1890s to a brush with Fenianism at the turn of the century, to quiet support for the independence struggle, and to pro-treaty views he maintained during the 1920s. Yeats's Taurus mirrored Ireland's national journey from this romantic nationalism of the late 19th century to a rather conservative version of nationalism in the 1920s and 30s. The last public figure to appear in Yeats's poetry, Parnell, was almost 50 years dead when Yeats wrote, Come Gather Round Me Parnellites, in the late 1930s. At the same time, he mulled over he continued to mull over the mysterious power of Cúchulainn and what happened in the post office in 1916 when he asked, and I quote, when Pierce summoned Cúchulainn to his side, what stalked through the post office? What intellect, what calculation, number, measurement replied? So 20 plus years after the Easter Rising, you have this great poet, Nobel laureate, global figure, still wondering, puzzling about what was it that actually inspired those events that occurred in 1916. So Ireland, I think, is privileged to have writers of the standard of Yeats and Joyce, that we can look at the world they came from through their eyes. And I think both of them were more astute in their analysis of the Ireland of their time than we might give them credit for. Joyce also wrote very perceptively about Irish political events, as did Yeats. So despite Yeats's global renown as a Nobel laureate, he stayed the course as an Irish writer and produced some of his finest work in the decade and a half after K. 
King Gustav, the, King Gustav V presented him with the Nobel Prize for Literature on December 10th, 1923, when Yeats became the preeminent public man of that formative era in Irish affairs. Thank you very much. So, Ted Smith, uh, I'm kicking it off because the first question is always the dumbest and then people come up with really smart questions. <laughs> um, Dan, that was fabulous and your delivery is up to that of William Gates. I think actually it's better. Um, <laughs> having listened to a few of his recordings, it's, it's far more robust. Um, there's something, you know, massively puzzling about Yeats yeah. and uh, the contradictions yeah. that you wrestle with and and makes it so interesting makes your book so compelling um, and of course this comparative type of idea is is ridiculous but why not when you're talking about Yeats have you ever thought of comparing him as a much loved usually much loved Irish poet with the other much loved Irish poet Seamus Heaney and the journey he went on during tumultuous times in Ireland in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And uh, Yeats's journey through an equally uh, difficult time. Thank you. Yeah, well, I actually, um, at, at, at Harvard, at the Institute of Politics, I taught an eight-week seminar um, uh, called um, Can the Center Hold, uh, inspired by, um, by Yeats. I mean, it was about, about the world of politics and international relations rather than poetry, but, but it was inspired by, by Yeats' poem, The Second Coming. And um, I started that um, course by, by giving all the students in the, in the course um, a copy of The Second Coming. And they actually, when I was leaving, they, they gave me a framed um, um, copy of The Second Coming they had printed for me. So um, I think I left at least that kind of mark on them. But I finished the course. My last lecture was I finished with I gave them a copy of the Cure of Troy and in particular uh, the idea that believe that a further shore is reachable from here and I think that's a very profound hopeful sentiment that Heaney uh, produced in that really great poem and it's a poem that uh, President Biden often quotes and indeed, I remember uh, around the time of the election, I think RTE actually showed a video of, of President Biden, of then candidate Biden, reading uh, the, the Curate Troy and a lot of images which kind of always summed up his, uh, his, his political philosophy. So, yes, I, I do think that, that James Heaney is definitely an heir to WB Yeats in, I mean, he wasn't as... He, he didn't have this kind of permanent immersion in the public life of Ireland the way that W.B. Yeats did. But nonetheless, his poems, I think, do, do speak of the Ireland of the late 20th century in a way that Yeats's poems speak of the Ireland of the turn of the century and beyond. And I, I take the view that as we become more distant from the events of 1916 and, and all that followed from that, that Yeats's work may become more and more important as a kind of a window on that period in history for those who maybe won't have the opportunity to come to a wonderful place like this and study Irish history, that I think Yeats's, as a witness to, the, to that period in Irish history, may become more important. And likewise, I think that Seamus Heaney uh, as hopefully the conflict in Northern Ireland is becomes more and more of a memory, or more and more of a historical memory rather than a personal memory, that maybe Heaney's poems will have the same capacity to, uh, to to remind us of some of the things that happened, and also of the way in which um, hope and history ultimately came to rhyme in Northern Ireland. And I, I must confess, I I have been rather impressed with um, the performance of the 
first minister and deputy first minister of Northern Ireland. I mean, now I know you'll see, people will say cynically it's just symbolism, it's just nonsense, it doesn't matter, damn, they'll be fighting um, very soon. Maybe they will, but, but you know, Michelle O'Neill went to Windsor Park and, you know, supported Northern Ireland and, and, and stood for the... Uh, for the for the national for the British national anthem that they play at Windsor Park, and then t I say today, Emma Little Pengelly went to uh, a, a GA club and did a bit of camogie playing. In fact, she looked a bit more uh, normal or a bit more natural as a camogie player than Michelle O'Neill is, uh, strangely enough, uh, given their respective backgrounds. So you know, so so I do think that 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 poets and writers are witnesses to the period from which they hail, in the sense that. Probably we know more about Elizabethan England because of Shakespeare. We may know, may know more about Victorian England because of Dickens and George Eliot, you know? So I think there's a, there, and I've always, I mean, this is partly laziness on my part because I'm a historian who doesn't like dusty archives. Uh, so I, so I've, I've actually chosen to use literature as my kind of um, um, way of, of approaching the past and, and, uh, and in Ireland, we have a very productive, and in fact, I'm, I'm thinking of turning my, the course I gave here in 2022 into a book um, dealing with not just with Yeats and Joyce, but with the entire gamut of Irish writing during the period between 1880 and 1940. So watch that space if I can uh, summon up the energy to uh, put pen to paper again. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Got to be somebody else. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you. Um, as we're about less than, fewer than uh, four hours away from the beginning of uh, the International Day of the Woman, could uh, could you tell us something about Yeats's relationship to woman? To <laughs> well, I mean, to, but to you know, to to themes related to women. Thank you. Well, I mean, he, you know, Yeats was a um, you know what was it was a romantic in all senses of the word. I would say. Um, uh, I mean, my friend Joe Hassett, who I think is a friend of, of uh, Glucksman Ireland House, has written about Yeats's muses, and um, there were there were many, um, starting with well, obviously Maud Gone, uh, largely unrequited, although eventually, uh, you know, um, uh, they, you know, they got together, as they say, in uh, in, in contemporary parlance. Um, um, there was Olivia Shakespeare, whom I think he should have married because she was he he was corresponding with her. For the rest of his life, and, and they were clearly kind of uh, very compatible uh, souls. Um, uh, she was the, the 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 mother of Ezra Pound's wife, Dorothy uh, Shakespeare. Um, and there was Florence Farr, who was an actress. Uh, and then uh, there was a woman called Mabel Dickinson in Dublin. Uh, and there was um, oh, he had a little. I mean, he had a flirtation, oh, not flirtation, but he had a sort of an obsession briefly with, um, with Isolde Gon, uh, Maud Gon's daughter, which, you know, is a little bit sort of... Uh, in fact, uh, on one occasion, when I, when I tweeted something about Yeats on, on, on Twitter or X, somebody came back to me and said, oh, it's disgraceful, this man, you know, he, you know, he, he was kind of, um, you know, he was preying on, 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 on underage girls. In fact, she wasn't an underage girl. Um, and in fact, I, I looked it up and... and the, the gap between Yeats and Isolde Gone was about the same as between T.S. Eliot and his second wife, you know. So, I mean, it, it was not, it was not the sort of, I mean, it was, it was, I, it's not something I recommend, but, but, it, but it's, uh, but, but it was not, it, but it was not completely, um, it was not, it was not completely um, out of the, um, out, out of the sort of frame. Um, yeah, so, and, and then, of course, in the 19... 30s, he, he had a series of, uh, of affairs with a woman called Margot Ruddock, uh, who, was a, who was a dancer, uh, wrote about her. Uh, he, was, um, he had um, Dorothy Wellesley, who was the wife of the Duke of, then Duke of Wellington. Um, he, was, he, he was close to her. Uh, and it was, a, it was another woman um, um, who, was a, uh, who was a journalist, uh, Edith Shackleton Heald. And his wife, um, his long-suffering wife, uh, sort of seemed to accept all of this stuff. Um, my wife says she wouldn't do that, so, I, I, so, I've, uh, so I've been warned. So I've been warned. <laughs> but uh, so he was, a, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think a lot of it was probably, um, you know, um, platonic philandering uh, rather than anything else. But, uh, but so, yeah, so he, so he was certainly, 
and I mean, he, obviously, in, in many ways, I mean, the three most important women in Yeats's life were, and I'm, I'm more gone because of this lifelong obsession with her, Lady Augusta Gregory, with whom, you know, she was almost like a, a mother figure to him, because his mother died, you know, his mother was sort of invalided at a relatively young age, and, and um, I don't think there was, there was a huge amount between them, whereas I think Lady Gregory provided this kind of, um, she provided a home for him because he could go to her home in the west of Ireland, and he spent the whole summer there and was, was the kind of uh, apple of her eye. Um, and then, of course, George Yates, uh, his wife, who, I mean, turned out to be a great asset to him because she, she could engage in automatic writing. Uh, there's a wonderful letter. He, he writes to Lady Gregory a few days after his, um, his wedding, saying, oh, my God, I made a terrible mistake. I, I don't love this woman. It's terrible. I'm going to... And then a few days later, he writes, says, I'm the happiest man in the world. Why? Because his wife had gone into a trance one day, and she started writing these the messages. And, this, and they spent ten, nearly 10 years. Almost every day, she'd sit down for hours and would... Uh, have to come up with these kind of um, this automatic writing. Now, what was going on there? I, I say in my book, I don't want to get involved in it because it's obviously personal stuff. But uh, but I mean, but clearly, at some level, she was sort of saving her marriage by you know by providing her husband with some of some of what he wanted. Um, so those were the three most important women in Yeats's life, and and so he was he was fortunate, a, a bit like a bit like James Joyce who. Uh, found support from a lot of very, you know, strong women who were willing to support him financially. And then, of course, his wife, Nora, uh, uh, Nora Barnacle, was a very strong figure, too. Yeats was fortunate to, 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 have, um, to have these, you know, very interesting and, uh, and impressive women in his life. I think Lady Gregory is someone that probably is underestimated because Yeats never really gave her the credit she maybe deserved. But she was a, a very good folklorist. Uh, and I think a good writer as well, and, and a very solid individual uh, who gave Yeats a lot of support during his life's journey. So yeah, he was fortunate to have these three, three powerful women in different ways in his life. Thank you so much. I wonder if you might perhaps say something about Yeats's interest in Hermeticism and the Golden Dawn. Well, well, I, I, and. Uh, that, yeah. And how you reconcile a, the public facing Yeats yeah, with secrecy and mysticism? Yeah. And yeah, I mean, as I said in my in my talk, uh, you know, he, he says you know, the mystical is at the heart of everything that he does, and that's that's obviously true. Um, I mean, I started off wanting to write a book that would be a, a complete biography of Yeats. Um, but I decided it couldn't be done in, you know, in my time frame. You know, I, couldn't, I couldn't get it done in the time I had available to me. Um, because if you write a full biography like, um, like, uh, like Ray Foster did, um, you have to go into all that stuff. And I frankly didn't, I wasn't interested in it. I didn't really, it didn't really, it wasn't something that, that I thought I wanted to spend, you know, a year trying to understand what Yeats was was up to in the Hermetic um, um, Order of the Golden Dawn and, and in the Theosophical Society and all these things. So he was he was he was constantly looking for uh, the keys to um, you know the understanding of of, of life and, and so forth. And he sought that very often in in magic and mysticism and the occult. But he also had this vigorous public life and. Uh, I think that at a certain stage, at least, the mystical and the Irish came together and they kind of formed a, a whole. And that continued to be an inspiration to Yeats even through the times when he became disenchanted with early 20th century Ireland and then with the Ireland of the 1920s and 30s. That this kind of this sense he had that there was something mystical about ancient Ireland that, that was, was connected with his own yearning for a mystical revelation. So I think that the coming together of the Irish bit of him and the mystical side to his personality, I think is what kept him engaged in Ireland, even though Ireland often disappointed him. As, as 
that we had Auden once wrote, Mad Ireland hurt you into verse. In other words, that he, he, because of his belief that he expressed at the end of his days, that ancient Ireland knew it all. And that he was writing about Cú Chulainn. At the very end of his life, in his last week, he was writing about Cú Chulainn. It tells you that, you know, the Irish and, and the mystical were somehow fused in Yeats's mind. It's really interested in your um, your idea of the kind of his development of his his writing life with the kind of the historical context that was developing. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about Yeats as a kind of self reflexive writer within that dev like sort of evolutionary uh, development of thinking. You know, you quoted line Cuchulain fighting the ungovernable sea and thinking about the circus animals desertion as like a kind of exercise in that and you mentioned the um the the reflection of you know the the play sending out certain men to be shot are there other examples of that and and kind of how do you see him as a yeah as a kind yeah, of I mean, reflexive writer within yeah, his I own mean, tradition when i wrote about the torus or the journey yet his journey through the island of his time i you know you you had the in the 1890s you have verse that is beautiful, but quite, quite simple, in that it doesn't have uh, that much intellectual substance to it. In fact, um, Richard Elman, uh, Joyce's great biographer, uh, he published an obituary of uh, George Yeats, Yeats's wife, and this actually comes back to your question. Um, and he wrote in the obituary that had Yeats died in 1917, instead of marrying George Hyde Lees. He would have been known as an important but limited writer. Someone who had a great lyric gift but didn't have much to say with that lyric gift. So my argument is that, that what happened in Ireland in the, in the first 20 years, 20, 30 years of the 20th century gave him something to say and it was better saying stuff about Ireland than it would have been saying stuff about the Europe of that time because that would have drawn him into perhaps a more a more damaging and dangerous advocacy of some of the, the authoritarian creeds of that era. So what you have with Yeats is this late romantic flowering uh, in the 1890s uh, culminating in his collection, The Wind Among the Reeds, in 1899, all those wonderful poems that are now so well known. Uh, then you have this kind of hardening of his poetry in the early part of the 20th century, and those poems that are quite bitter. I don't like those poems, but I can understand how how the the writing has changed, and they're more. They've got their boxing gloves on. They're you know they're you know they're they're, they're willing to hit back, but they're they're embittered. Uh, and I think that was, it shows a rather, a rather, un, a rather unpleasant side of Yeats's character. And then the, you know, the heroic element comes back in 1916. You know, he thought that Romantic Garden was dead and gone. And three years later, and he, he, he wrote this in a letter, he said, oh, uh, I, I thought that Romantic Garden was dead and gone three years ago. Uh, how wrong... How wrong could I be? So I think Easter Rising was this moment when he, he woke up to the fact that, yes, maybe there was some heroic potential still left in the Ireland of his time. And that, I think, kept him going for most of the rest of his life. And towards the end of his life, he, he starts to turn his own circle into a heroic uh, clan. So you have all these people, John O'Leary, his father, Augusta Gregory, John Millington Singh, they all become these heroic figures. And the critic Ivor Winters is sort of scoffed and says, you know, who cares about these, these, these people that nobody has ever heard of? Who wants to know about these, these, these people? Um, my point is that the glory of Yeats is that he did make great poetry out of people that maybe weren't heroic at the sort of uh, highest level of, of, hero of heroism. So that final phase is one of, of, of 
uh, here, you know, you have it's discovering the, the Celtic heroes in, the, in, in, his, in, 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 his, in his early years, and then, you know, discovering the public life of Ireland and you know the sort of heroic canon of Irish martyrdom, what she, you know, refers to in uh, in uh, romantic in September nineteen thirteen. You know, Lord Edward Fitzgerald, Robert Emmett, Wolf Tone, all that delirium of the brave. And then, towards the end of his life, he creates his own heroes. And these are the people from his own circle. Uh, what he says, all Olympians. And I wrote in my book, they were Olympians because Yeats said they were. Not because they won the Olympic Games. Yes. Uh, Dan, as we approach uh, half past eight, we've kept you on, on your feet for uh, a long time. So let me reiterate as uh, director of, of the House um, just what a great pleasure it is to have you back and to have Greta back. We're friends. Um, we hope you'll, you'll uh, come again. We're going to continue the conversation downstairs. I'd like to ask you one last question, if I could. Um, you mentioned... Uh, a book you might write, a broader book that came out of um, your teaching here, indeed. Um, but I wondered, uh, you've written on Joyce, uh, you've written on Yeats. Um, is, there another, is there another individual, uh, whether in the literary world or the political world, uh, who grips your imagination, another Irish figure that you're drawn to writing about? Yeah. I, I have two, actually. Um, um I find Parnell to be um, endlessly fascinating, and I, I, at some stage, I, I hope to get around to to writing about Parnell, uh, for two reasons. One is because he was this extraordinary political figure. Joyce wrote about him and said he was a man without any obvious qualities to be a political leader who had this kind of amazing ability to make the leading. British politician of his, of his day obey his orders. In other words, that's the. Um, so Parnell, extraordinary political talent, but also he's the only person that I can think of that attracted the attention of two major writers, James Joyce and W. B. Yeats. I can't think of any other figure in modern history, any other political figure that was actually written about in the way that Joyce and Yeats wrote about Parnell. The second figure is, um, comes from my own background in Waterford. I, I'm the patron of the Thomas Francis Marr Society, which uh, every year celebrates on the 7th of March, or the nearest Sunday, the, uh, the, uh, the first unfurling of the Irish tricolour in Waterford on the 7th of March, 1848. And because I've kind of followed in Marr's footsteps in a way, uh, you know, I've, I've, I'm from Waterford, um, I have been to Stonyhurst, where, where, where he studied. I've seen some of his, some of his student writings there. Uh, I've been to Australia, of course, where he spent a couple of years incarcerated. And I've been to, I think, all the battlefields of the Civil War where Maher fought as a general leader of the Irish Brigade. And I've been to Montana, where, where, um, where um, you have this wonderful equestrian statue of Maher, which was erected in the early 20th century. Despite the fact that Maher was only acting governor, for one year, and yet the Irish in Montana insisted. And what happened was, I discovered this when I looked into it, um, there was a man called Marcus Daly, who was known as the Copper King, and he developed the copper mines, uh, which was the richest, at that time, um, Butte was one of the richest places in the world, and um, uh, th th there was a fight between the orange and the green element in, in Montana over where the, the um, capital of Montana should be, and uh, the Irish lost the argument. It was claimed that ballot boxes had been stuffed and so on, but I won't get into that because it's a sensitive, sensitive territory. Um, but um, Marcus Daly, even though the Irish didn't get the, the um, capital where they wanted it, in a place that he had a, he had a smelter, uh, which, which, a, a town that he ran, which still has, he still has the only Hibernian hall uh, west of the Mississippi. Believe it or not, it, it's like a, it's like a kind of a it's like a, a piece of Ireland from the from the past. It's still there, but Marcus Daly, the Irish may have lost the battle 
over the um, over the uh, location of the capital of, of Montana, now in Helena. But they made sure that their man, Thomas Francis Maher, was put up there on a pedestal to remind those who had won the argument that the Irish never lie down. <laughs> so, so um, those are the two. That, uh, that I'm, you know, and I mean, another person that I'm that I'm interested in is George Russell, A.E., who was um, not as a poet, because I think he was a, a fairly modest uh, poet, but as a great sort of, you know, journalist and editor of the Irish Homestead and the Irish Statesman, which I think were important journals for the Ireland of their time. Thank you very much. Thank you.